right. You may be seated. The Lord is good, isn't he? All the time, every day, he's God and he is awesome. We're going we're gonna to go to the very beginning of this Bible study. We're going to go through some of our projections, our slides, or whatever you want to call them, our pictures. I want to run, run over some things. If you weren't here uh, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, well, Thursday night we didn't get very far, but Wednesday and Friday covering things in the Word of God. You know, every, every question that you have is a valid question, and, and uh, uh, any kind of preaching, no matter if it's preaching on giving or preaching on uh, going to church, prayer, creates some kind of questions. And uh, the more you go to church, the more questions that are asked, and, uh, and you have to get answered. And I guess prophecy is one of the greatest stimulant of questions that there is in the Bible. But the good thing about it is the doctrine of when Jesus is coming and your view on the coming of the Lord is not a point of view of fellowship or salvation. It is just a mere fact of looking in the Word of God and believing what the Word of God says. What I'm trying to say is this. Some believe that Jesus is going to come back in the middle of the tribulation. Some believe that Jesus is coming back at the end of the tribulation. And when I speak about it and talk about it, I, I, I may sound like I'm trying to be a smart aleck. I know on Facebook I'm uh, I'm creating a lot of questions, and and uh, one person said, you know, I, I don't want to have an arg arguing spirit. Well, you know, of course, you can't tell across the thousands of miles the distance between our t uh, the two of us. I, I don't argue it, and uh, it's not a point of argument. Jesus is going to come. You got to be ready. You got to stay ready. If we go through the tribulation, it's going to take the same living for God before it that it takes to go through it. But when I read the Word of God and I see so, how evident that it is, that's why I'm just so open about it. I'm not going to argue with anybody at any point about that. And I jokingly tell people that are that like to try to you know kind of have a little argument about it. I tell them, well, you know, you're probably right. You're probably going through the tribulation. And um, I said, but I'm going out before the tribulation, but, you know, be it according to your faith. If you're preaching and believing you're going to go through it, then you probably are going to go through it. And you'll maybe you can fit in with that 144,000 that are sealed during the tribulation period, have to flee for their life. And uh, it would be good to lose some weight so you can be fast on your feet and be able to get around and, you know, get out of here. But there's so many things that point toward Jesus coming before the tribulation period, number one is Daniel 9 is written to the Jews. Daniel 9 is, is where you find the base teaching of the 70th week called Jacob's Trouble. Jacob's Trouble is that last week of the 70 weeks. Now, in Bible prophecy, the Lord hides things from the unsincere. When he said there are 70 weeks determined upon you, Daniel, and upon my people. Uh, you, you would think, first of all, that, well, that's 70 weeks. That's going to be something going to be fulfilled here in just a short period of time. But he, he, he gave us the secret formula to knowing how long that was. 70 weeks. He makes the statement from the commandment to go forth to build, to rebuild Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had been destroyed. From the going forth of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, Till Messiah be cut off. And uh, he said it would be 69 weeks. And then there would be another week after Messiah was cut off. And that cutting off is when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and was completely rejected, crucified, and that was the cutting off. It was exactly 483 years or seven times 69. So, then it leaves one, one week left over. If one week is 7 times 7, 49, then it leaves one week left over. And that's that last week of tribulation, seven years, each day being a year. And the reason we know that formula is because we look from the commandment to uh, rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah's cut off, the day Jesus went to the city of Jerusalem, was 483 years. And that left seven years left of the 490 prophesied by Daniel about the Lord. So we know that seven years of tribulation that last in the book of Revelation is about the Jew, not written to the church. 
Matthew 24 says, the Jews are asking Jesus, what shall be the end of the world? What's going to be the sign of the end of the world? And so the Lord begins to go through Matthew 24 telling them about uh, the signs of the end. One thing he tells them is he tells them, pray that your flight, when you're fleeing from the Antichrist, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Now that's definitely not a Christian church term because the Sabbath, which is on Saturday, the early church met on Sunday. Sunday, the first day of the week on the resurrection. The Sabbath is Saturday, but that's not the day that we're supposed to come to the house of God and gather together. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is the keeping of the Sabbath now. Sabbath is not kept on Saturday, but Hebrews teaches that we keep the Sabbath day by keeping the Holy Ghost and living the Holy Ghost filled life. That is the Sabbath day. The Holy Ghost is called the the rest, wherein the weary shall rest. The, it, no matter how impact your life is, no matter how uh, stressed you are, if you'll get prayed up, get prayed through, and get full of the Holy Ghost, it just brings peace into your life. You quit worrying about things. You have faith and confidence in God. The night I got the Holy Ghost, uh, April the 6th, 1973, nothing in my world changed except me. That was the only thing that changed that night. I still had the same uh, evil friends. I still had the same enemies. I even had the same bills there waiting for me. Everything was the same. And, uh, but the thing that changed was me. And God gave me the Holy Ghost, and that was the day of rest, and that was the Sabbath day for the New Testament Christian. And then God began to move all these things in my life day by day, week by week, month by month, and began to work everything out. So this 70th week called Jacob's Trouble is what it is. The Word of God says tribulation is called Jacob's Trouble. That's Jewish. That's Hebrew. Not the church. Romans 11 says that the natural branch, olive branch, will be cut out and a wild branch will be cut in and that's the church. Then the wild branch will be cut out and the natural branch will be put back in. It did not say they would coexist at the same time. If you know anything about the seven dispensations of God, God doesn't use two dispensations at the same time. That's why it's malarkey when you hear churches say, go to the church of your choice. Let's just try to figure out what church we like the best and which one fits us the best. There's but one church. I'm not saying this local assembly is the only church. There's only one church that preaches what the apostles preached. There's not two or three or seven or eight or ten. You either preach what the Bible says, and the day of Pentecost was the birthday of the church. They repented. They were baptized in Jesus' name. I know some of you went to Israel too, just like I have. And in my many trips to Israel, one time we were standing with a rabbi, and he pointed out, showed us the indentations uh, in the landscape around us. And once he pointed them out, you could see them, hundreds of holes dug out. And he said, you know what all those are? And I, I, we, our little group said no. And he said, those are the, the leftovers of the pits they dug and irrigated to fill, to baptize people on the day of Pentecost and days after. Now, Israel is an arid land. And there's not a lot of abundance of water. And so if anybody was going to sprinkle, it would have been those guys in those days. But they dug with shovels, pits, and irrigated, filled them up so that thousands could be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we emphatically preach, you must be immersed, and you must be immersed with the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I don't like to go out and be different from everybody else and have an argument spirit and things of that nature, but we must preach what the Bible says. We've got to preach the truth, and we've got to get people ready for uh, that great notable day. Now, there are two, thing, two terms used in the Bible about Jesus' return. 
He actually comes three times. He comes in Bethlehem through the womb of a woman. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He takes upon him the robe of flesh. He's the sacrifice. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He hangs on the cross. When they came to break his legs, and the reason they were going to break his legs when he was on the cross is because a, a festival day was approaching. And it was not kosher to crucify men on a, a holiday. It'd be like Christmas, you know, celebration of Christmas in America, and uh, we would just uh, put someone to death on Christmas Day. You know, and so they were coming to break the legs of the, the, the three that were crucified. When you break the legs, you hasten the death. The death of most people on the cross was not the nails. It was asphyxiation. You would hang on that cross, and after weariness and tiredness and hours and hours, if not days, your body would finally slump, couldn't hold yourself up from your legs. And then at the angle of your arms and the weight of your body, you, your, your breath would get shorter and shorter, less oxygen in the body. It would bring about an almost unconsciousness that would leave you hanging even more limp than before. And you would actually suffocate to death on the cross. Very slow, like a slow drowning. So when they came to break their legs, they came to hasten that on, to quicken that. But when they came to Jesus, he was already gone. He was dead. He did not die of the nails. He did not die of, a, of lack of oxygen. He died because in that moment that he took the sins of the whole entire world, and when he took the sins of the future world, it was more than physical man could bear. And he died of a broken heart. He died of a heavy spirit. Remember in the garden, I've been right there where history says, uh, and there's actually trees in that garden that are over 2,000 years old that were actually in the garden when Jesus was there. And uh, there's a huge rock formation in this garden on Mount Olives. And uh, of all the places, it's got to be because of, of what it looks like. But Jesus there praying, prayed with such burden, such heaviness, that his sweats, uh, the sweat of his body became blood. Proven factor. Doctors say if enough stress, extreme stress, can burst the small capillaries and create a oozing of blood out of the pores of your skin. And so even before the cross, it was so heavy. The sins of the whole world. Do you remember how you felt when you came to God? How heavy you were, how depressed, oppressed, how bleak, how dark, how tragedy was engulfing your life when you came to God and repented of your sins. Multiply that by an unknown number. And yet there Jesus was taking the sins of the world. Well, folks, when he comes back again, he will not come back as a wounded Savior. He will not come back as a crucified Jesus. He will not come back in the limitation of flesh. But he will come back in his glory and in his power and in his majesty. It will be so powerful, his return, when we see him in the clouds. It will be so powerful that in that moment that we see him and we lift up our heads and it happens in the twinkling of an eye, that's faster than a blink. In a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise. And we will caught up to be with him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4. It, it will be so powerful that in one glimpse of him, the Bible said, you shall put on immortality. We that are alive, when we see him, and one moment of seeing him as he is, is going to transform our bodies. And we will put on immortality. We will be like him. Think how awesome that's going to be. All of a sudden, every weakness and everything in your body you abhor that you wish could be different will be gone. The battle of the flesh, the door that Satan uses into our mind and our spirit will be slammed shut. And we will go and in one uh, glimmer of a 
moment of a second of a blink of an eye, we will be there with Jesus in the clouds. And the Bible said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible talks about the church is the bride of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, even though we have the promises of God from cover to cover of the Bible, yet the Bible said in Hebrews, there is no better promise, no better generation, no better dispensation than the dispensation of the church. No one else in the history of mankind is going to share the glory, share the power like the church of the living God. That's why it is crazy for us to give less than our best when God is offering the best to this generation. God is offering your best. This is what is really mind-blowing. As great as church is, we are but scraping the surface of the promise and the power and the majesty of Almighty God. We're just scratching the surface. I believe that if we'll just apply our hearts in this church till now till Jesus comes, or as I put on Facebook today, Jesus came for thousands last night. There were thousands that went out of this world last night and met their creator. And for them, Jesus came last night. And who knows this time next year, even if the Lord doesn't return, how many the Lord will call home out of the pews of this church. Do you think it's going to matter then if you went to the beach on a Sunday? Or if you got that raise? Or you were able to buy that brand new Harley Davidson? I, I, I've got a 2011. I want a 2015 so bad right now. But you know what? My wife's, I mean, the Lord doesn't want me to have one yet. Hallelujah. You know, it's just sitting there at the house. But that won't matter. The disappointments of this world won't mean a thing when Jesus comes. Somebody that persecutes you, makes fun of you, makes light of you, won't matter at all. What you're going through is but, a, as Paul said, what you're going through now is but a light affliction compared to the glory of God. You're down here 70 years, maybe 80, 85, some a little bit more. How much how can that be compared to eternity? This is a dress rehearsal for eternity. You've got to get that in your mind, that you're not just here trying to just, you know, enjoy the presence of God for a while and go home. You are getting yourself ready to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. The change will be so imminent, so powerful that in the word of God it says when the world saw the bride of Jesus, those that rule and reign with him during the millennial and eternity, that they ask, who is that? And someone cries out and says, it's the bride of Jesus. It's his church. For the patriarchs of the Old Testament, they did not, they did not see the church. Daniel, Isaiah, all of them knew there was a time of the Gentiles. The time of the Gentiles is the church age. And Hosea said that he would call a people that were not his people, his people. They all knew that there was something along the lines, but no, none of those prophets knew there was going to be a church age. When Messiah was cut off, he was cut off and the church began. When his, God's people rejected him, let it, his blood be on us and our children. The Lord turned to that Gentile church. And the Gentiles, remember they had Paul come preach. And the Gentile church began to explode. The teaching of the church was so mysterious that Peter himself, filled with the Holy Ghost, believed only Jews would receive it. And when the Gentiles began to receive the Holy Ghost, he didn't even want to go minister in their churches because he didn't understand the great manifold blessing and mercy of God. God allowed us to come in, folks. He allowed us to get into the best dispensation, the best hour. I say to people, 
who think they're going to go to the tribulation and they think they're going to live for God in the tribulation. If you can't live for Him now during grace and mercy, how will you live for God when it's not here? This is the time to serve God, to live for God. The Bible talks about that second coming in 1 Thessalonians 4 and and uh, Revelation chapter 4, isn't it, Maz, isn't it uh, great that the number 4 is, is repeated? 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about the rapture of the church. And, and uh, Revelation 4 is synonymous. It is the rapture of the church. John, the revelator, was a member of the apostolic church. And if you look at him in his visitation to heaven and his revelation of the book of Revelation, it is a type of the rapture of the church. Before one seal is open, in, in Revelation 6, before one trumpet sounds, before any of the wraths of God are poured out of the bowls, in the book of Revelation, a door opens, a trumpet sounds, and John is caught up into heaven and appears before the throne of God and begins to see the events that are going to take place. I, I remind you what I said the other night, the terminology is we and us under chapter 4, and it's they and them after that. John the Revelator speaking and, and, and writing. And so when I say everything has been fulfilled for the coming of the Lord, I don't mean everything's fulfilled in the Bible. There's many things that are going to happen. But God knows everything that's in the future and has predicted so many things. Did you know in the Minor prophets, the Lord prophesied there be oil in Egypt. He prophesied it before the oil was ever discovered there. Before the Saudis and uh, all the Arab nations. Do you know that when Hagar, the mother of all Arabs, was in the wilderness and she had fled because her son was not to be the heir, I, Isaac was going to be the heir of God. When she's in the desert and they're dying, they, they think she thinks she's going to die. An angel appears and tells her and God speaks and says, he will make a great nation out of them. And, uh, and he did. The oil is there in all of those nations and the wealth is there. And there are many things. He did not say they would be the chosen of God and they would bear the truth of God. God said the promise of God will come through Isaac and beating in the chest and beating in the hearts of Israel over there right now is the bloodline of the 12 tribes of Israel. The promise of God that Jesus will come back and set his feet on Mount Olives and walk down through the Kindred Valley and in through the eastern gates and set up his kingdom. That a sword will come out of his mouth, a two-edged sword at the, at the battle of Armageddon in the valley of Megiddo. The Bible says that blood will run to the horse's bridle. It will take months to bury the dead that are destroyed and killed that gather themselves around Israel. Now listen, 1948 Israel became a nation. And I believe that 1948 was the first tick of the second of the end time for the church and for the world. This generation shall not pass away. There are many People that have the uh, idea about how long is a generation. But a real generation, a true, genuine generation is when the last person in 1948 that was born, this is my opinion, 1948, when that last person is dead, that's the generation that's gone. He didn't say at the end when the last one dies, but that generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. I don't know the hour. I don't know the exact time Jesus is coming, but we've got to get this message out. I don't mean go crazy with it. You know, the Lord never told us, go dig a hole, get in a cellar somewhere, fill it up with food, lock the doors, because Antichrist is coming. It does not say that. It tells us Jesus Christ is coming. The church is commanded not to look for a hole in the ground, but look for a hole in the sky. A church that believes and teaches 
and accepts the word of God and the return of Jesus Christ is going to be a healthy church. Every time the enemy you know, wants to swamp over me, I remind myself, that's all right, devil, your time's coming. Your day's coming. Just one angel, Satan, is going to bind you up and wrap you up with a chain, and you're going to be chained up for 1,000 years. Not 100,000 angels, just one angel angel with the power of the word of God, the commandment of God can wrap the devil up. What did the Lord say about you? He said you're greater than angels. Your promise is greater than angels. You think the Antichrist would be able to run around America without the church binding and I mean how many prayer meetings would break out and how many uh, hindering spirits would come against the devil? Binding him up. No, the church is going to be gone, caught up to be with Jesus in the air. I'm going to prove it to you in the very closing of this Bible lesson. I I want to show you some of our projections. I want to go over a few things with you very quickly here this morning. And then we're going to kind of bring this to a close. And The next service, God has spoke to me about this next service. God is going to impact this church. I'm going to show you, I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to give you the word of God that's going to make this church one of the 15 of 2015. I'm telling you that right now. It's sad that we have some that don't live for God anymore. The door is always open to the backslider to come back to God. But we've got to quit crying over spilt milk and we've got to reach this world. Every missionary that comes, Everything the pastor says, this is our project, this is what we're doing. We need all men on deck. We need everybody joining in. Don't get a spirit of Nick picking the church and Nick picking the man of God. That's the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world today right now. Do you know it is very probable, and I, 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 know, I believe personally that it is not just probable, it is a fact. That the Antichrist is born and living today, right now. Now, every time a president is elected, all of a sudden he becomes the Antichrist. It, you know, and they, Obama's name figures out to be 666. And all, you know, all that stuff. It's okay. I mean, if you want to study that stuff, if it encourages you, that's great. But I'm not going to preach and teach something that's not sound Bible stuff. I, I will entertain, perhaps. Maybe so's, but I will not preach to you anything that I don't believe is biblically sound. We don't want to go in the wrong direction. We're not going to use it today. I'm not going to use the coming of the Lord to scare the living daylights out of you. I'm not going to call somebody out and say you're on your way to hell. And you know, I mean, I mean, it's up to you to make your mind up that you're going to serve God. You're going to give God your best. If you make a mistake, you repent, get back up. I don't care how many times you fail. Now, I'm not talking about your pastor, but a lot of preachers, they don't want the saints to know the abundance of mercy because they think that if they let you know how full of mercy God is, you'll try it out every day. But the truth is, that's not what the Lord told us to look at this thing. He said, preach to my church the mercy and the grace of God. And I do it. I, I give it to everybody. I give the mercy and the grace of God That God can forgive any sins. John said, I write these things unto you that you sin not. That's the first priority after you're saved. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If this week you stole somebody's pig, go give it back. Unless you ate it. And if you ate it, go buy some bacon. Take it to them. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying you have to ask them to forgive you. You might start a war. But, you know, make, make it right in your heart. Don't say, well, I messed up. I made a mistake. Uh, well, I'm not going to make it. That's crazy. When people fail and they come to God, you need to give them that grace. This church needs to preach the Word of God strong, the things of God absolute. But we need to have so much mercy and so much grace in this church that everybody can make it. There's room at the altar for everybody. There's room at the cross for every man, woman, boy, and girl. I want to show you these these projections, these slides here. 
let, let's, let's go through them. We covered the four, I'm just doing this because there's some that were not here. The four blood moons. Four blood moons is four eclipses of the moon that is going to fall on four of the great uh, festivities of Israel. There are seven given by God that are the seven greatest festivities. The Passover is one in which they celebrate the, the night the death angel passed over Israel in, in Goshen in Egypt. And, and there are seven of them that are celebrations. Well, starting last year in April, the first blood moon appeared. I saw it. I went out and I looked at it. And then there was the second one. And now there are going to be two this, this year. Every time there's been four blood moons, there has been great change in Israel. The blood moons have nothing to do with this church. The only sign given unto us is Jesus Christ. We, well, the, uh, Revelation 12 talks about the woman with the moon beneath her feet, the sun above her head. The moon has always been a, uh, been a type of the heavenlies for Israel. It's a sign of Israel in the heavens. The Lord said, I will put my signs in the heavens. The four blood moons, though, always happen during great changes in Israel. The fact that we're telling you during the end time, Israel's going to be surrounded by its enemies. It's going to be attacked. The Lord's going to come back. There's supposed to be a peace agreement uh, worldwide between Israel and all the nations. The, the man of sin will be revealed, the Antichrist. And I, I, all I can say is these blood moons, well, you, they're not may not be the rapture of the church, but they are once again God telling his church and whoever will believe and look, these are the signs of the end time. Stay ready, get prayed up, get in the house of God, get your family in and serve God. The four blood moons. Next slide. The four horsemen. The, the very first seal that opens up in Revelation 6, there are the seals, seven of them. There's the trumpets, seven of them. There are the bowls or vows. There are seven of them. Each seventh one opens up the next seven. You've got six and then seven of the seals, and the seven seals, the opening of all seven of the trumpets, seven angels with seven trumpets. Each one of them is a pouring out of wrath. Uh, it is an announcement by God of things that's going to happen. Uh, one third of the earth dies during these uh, 21 uh, uh, pouring outs of the wrath of God, sores, diseases, uh, pestilences, earthquakes. All these things are in these, uh, these 21 uh, wraths of God that's poured out in the earth. This is during the tribulation period. And in the closing of this Bible lesson, I'm going to give you as much absolute proof as I can give you that the Lord's not going to pour His wrath out on His own body or His own bride. That's who the church is. But that's going to be poured out upon the world that has rejected God, turned away from God, and God is correcting this world, getting ready to possess this world when he comes back in Revelation 19. Next slide. The mark of the beast is found in Revelation 13. We've heard it say, said 666. Now, don't think that 666 is going to be that number. It, it, it's, it's not going to be, probably not going to be, I, I can almost say absolute, but I don't want you know, because no one really knows it all. But it's not going to be a 666. But 6 is the number of man. One less than God. And there are going to be three great personages that are evil and work against Israel during the tribulation period. The beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist. Now the difference in, in, in the antichrist is this. There are seven years of tribulation. There are three and a half and three and a half, two sections of that. In the middle of those seven years, the Bible says there's going to be an act that's going to happen in the temple that's to be rebuilt. If 
Jewish worship and offering of sacrifices picked back up after rapture of the church, finishing the 70 weeks of prophecy of Jacob's trouble, and it says it will. If there's going to be a, a, a temple rebuilt, sacrifice begins again. The Bible said in the middle of that agreement, the middle of that peace, the middle of that time, something's going to happen. It says that Satan is going to be cast down from the heavenlies. Now that's not the heaven, the third heaven, the glory of God. But that is the heaven, the second heaven. There are three heavens. The Bible tells us this, teaches us this. There's the first heaven, the earth to where the atmosphere st- or where the clouds are. From the clouds to the end of, of, uh, uh, of the universe, the outer space, the second heaven. And that's where Satan goes to and fro and back and forth. He is not omnipresent, but he can travel like an angel travels, very quick, very fast, faster than light. But he can't be everywhere. And so he is in that second heavens. I'm going to tell you something going to blow your mind. Watch this. I guarantee it's going to blow your mind. The second heaven is where Satan is. Remember what the Lord said, where have you been, Satan? I've been going to and fro. Ephesians says he is the God of this world, little g. Daniel, when he prayed and asked God for an answer to prayer, the Bible said the angels battled in the second heaven for 21 days to get the answer to prayer to Daniel. And Daniel was told by the angels, we wrestled with the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia is Satan. The prophetic word says there will be a rebuilding of the Persian Empire during the tribulation period. That is the alignment together of nations, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Iran, Iraq, Libya, northern Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Now even though we think Saudi Arabia is our friends, the truth is they are Islamic. They have... You won't see this in the front pages of our newspapers because our government is desperately trying to work with the Saudis. But the truth is, they have never betrayed Islam, nor Syria, Jordan, Iran, Iraq, or any of these nations. They may have protected their oil fields and their people and allowed the United States to come in during the first Gulf War, but never have they stood against Islam or the destruction of any of these nations. And all of that is the Persian Empire. And the Bible said the prince of Persia was trying to keep the answer from breaking through. Watch this. When you're praying and you're worshiping God, you're praising God. Have you ever praised and worshiped and it seemed like your praise wasn't getting anywhere? Some days it's like that. Some days you come to church and the praise singers get up here. They can feel it. Us preachers can feel it. We're preaching and it's like we're something is buffeting, something is keeping us from breaking through. Some of those days that we feel that, we've actually prayed more, fasted more, believed more. But yet the resistance is there and that's where we walk away and scratch our head. How can we have resistance when we're actually doing more, believing more? Because Satan activates, hovers over in the second dimension of heaven over us, when we, he sees us activating our faith, he sees us moving in faith, he sees revival breaking out, he tries to cause a buffer zone between us and the glory of God, and so our praise has to break through that dimension. And you must know that you have power to break through any resistance or any hindrance that is trying to hinder you. I tell you what I do when I sense and I feel uh, Satan's bunch up there trying to stop the breakthrough, I pour it on. I just go literally crazy. And I tell him, I whisper it to him while I'm preaching, you're fixing to get the best now, Satan, that I've got. You woke me up. You came against me, and now I'm waking up. I'm not like everybody else. You attack me. I don't lay down and stay home. I wake up, and I get a hold of God, and I give my best. 
When you see hell coming against your family, rise up in faith. Get in the house of God. Bombard heaven with the glory. When the bills are past due, instead of looking at that notice and hanging your head down, start shouting in Jesus' name right there. Give God the praise and you'll break that dimension. All right, watch this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to blow your mind. Genesis chapter 1. I'm trying to kind of reserve myself for the, the after Sunday school because I'm going to blow up up here. Hallelujah. God spoke to me about this service. I'm so excited. I can't wait for this service, this next service. He just told me what he's going to do, and I'm just real excited about it. You look at Genesis, and the Bible talks about the seven days of creation. My favorite book in the Bible outside of Acts my salvation is found there, is the book of Genesis because it has so much revelation in it that people never see. It is called Genesis because Genesis means beginning. And you can see the beginning of so many things found there in the book of Genesis. We exercise so much of our energy trying to find the beginning of things. We know where the church starts. It gives us strength in our doctrine. We search back in our families to see where our family tree began. Sometimes we found out there was an outlaw there, or horse thief or something, you know, we, unless we hadn't looked. But in Genesis, it talks about the seven days of creation. Just like the book of Revelation, you find sevens in the book of Genesis. The number seven repeated over and over again in Genesis. Seven spirits of God in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Seven churches. Well, on and on. But you see the seven days of God, and did you know that seven times in the book of Genesis chapter 1, seven times God says it is good. He creates on the first day, and he says, it is good. He creates on the third day, and he says, it is good twice. On the second day, he does not say it's good. But he says it's good on the third day. And that's why that a lot of the Orthodox Jews get married on the third day of the week. Because the third day of the week has a double portion prophetic utterance over it. And that day is the day of the creation of seed. And so when they get married on that day, they feel like God's going to bless their seed. Their children are going to be blessed. And they're going to be blessed with many children. And so many of them choose that third day. To, but the second day, he refuses to say it's good. When you look at it, you can see why he doesn't say it's good on the second day. Because that's when he creates the heavens. That's when he divides the heavens. And our God looks down and sees Satan being permitted at this time only by God to feel the second heaven. Now, some of you are looking at me like a cow looks in a brand new gate. Well, you got to be country. You know, a cow goes through the same gate all the time. He never notices it. But you put a new gate up, he stops all of a sudden. Gets scared. Somebody kind of looking at me. That's, that's, that teaching is sound. It's more sound than your dollar, which is not very sound right now. So that second day, he does not say it's good because the heaven, the second heaven is populated. Angels that are fallen. It's where Satan is doing his business. He's working around. Satan's got more sense than some people's got. He's got enough sense to know this world down here is wicked, crazy, and dumb, and stupid. He doesn't do his work. He gets above it, works above it. We get down here and try to have church in it and don't get our minds into the supernatural. We need to be smarter than the, the devil and get our mind into the supernatural. Forget about the house. Forget about the chores. Forget about the bills and get your mind into the supernatural. He, he, will, he does not say it's good. But he saves the next day, the seed day, for double portion good. 
because there's no way he's going to look at the heavens. And you got old Lucifer in there for a season, going to and fro and fighting. He's not going to bless the heavens. So here you've got Satan locking down the second heaven, fighting Daniel's prayers, fighting our prayers, trying to mix up the signals of the Holy Ghost working in us, comes against the platform, trying to stop him, can't do it, but tries to. And God will not put on it the blessing of it's good, but puts the next day, the day of seed, as a double portion. A seed is anything you sow with your mouth, anything you sow with your hands, anything you sow with your pocketbook is the seed given to God. And God will put double portions on anything you speak for Him, anything you do for Him, anything you give to Him. Before you invest in the stock market, before you invest in real estate, invest in the kingdom of God to get the double portion on your money. So here you've got this second day. Satan's got the heavens locked in. Angels are battling through it. Daniel, the book of Daniel. We're sending up praise and worship, and sometimes we have to go through the interference. But watch what happens. Holy Ghost overshadows Mary, and that is in her in her is of the Spirit of God. And Jesus is born, the God man. Thirty years old, he begins to preach. Thirty-three. He's crucified. They put him in a tomb. They roll the stone up. And then on that third day, an earthquake happens. And the stone rolls back. And this Jesus, whose body should be falling apart, decaying, comes up out of that tomb. And then for 40 days, he teaches his apostles about the word of God, the things of God. And he gives them a 40-day Bible school experience. And there's nothing wrong with studying the Bible, going to Bible school. But when Jesus is your instructor, you're going to get more than you are any other time or place. And so now... Jesus says, I'm going to go away. I'm leaving just like, I'm coming back just like I leave, but I'm leaving. And the Bible said he ascends up into the heavens. Now we preach about the power of his coming. But the truth is, when he went through that second heaven, when he lifted off the last part of Luke and first part of Acts, he ascends up, he broke a dimension that had this world bound. He broke through the dimension of all the demons and all the devils and Satan's own lair. His kingdom, his stronghold is the second heaven and he broke through that and went through it and then he told his church, you're going to break through it too. That's why you have a secret power in you to break through with worship and prayer. He knows that you're sons and daughters of God and he knows he couldn't stop him in the tomb. He couldn't stop him in the ascension and he worries about you and I because we're going to break through that dimension also and we're going to break through that seventh heaven, that second heaven and we're going to go be with Jesus. Next, next slide. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Mark of the beast, 666. Well, there's three great figures. It's possible the mark of the beast. They have a lot to do with the beast, the antichrist, the false prophet. 666. It's very possible that it might have to do with your number that will be given to you one day that you will operate in that number. Everyone already has three sets of sixes already. They don't know that. You have your social security number, but you have your country ID number. 
And then you have in the United States another number given to you. Each one of them, amazingly, is when they all form together, make up six, three sixes. That could be the 666. Then there's the barcode that is uh, a simulate in our world today that represents names and uh, represents identities, products, things of that nature. But the fact that the, we're, we're moving to a cashless society and we're moving to numbers, I mean, there are just things going, you, you, let me tell you something, all you young folks. When I was born, you didn't have to have a social security number. But now, no one is born. As a little child, they are given a number right away. Next slide. All who take the mark will be lost forever. That's what Revelation says. The new world order is the society of the Antichrist. Now, can anybody in this congregation not admit that the last 30 years, the world has been moving together as one society? I mean, it is just, I mean, when I was a kid preacher, I preached this. But no one, you know, everybody just looked at me like I lost my mind. One world order. United States going to, I remember one old gentleman came up to me, old silver-headed guy with tennis shoes on. Old timer, filled with the Holy Ghost. Man, he was just gun barrel straight. He didn't believe in chewing gum. He come up to me, and boy, I mean, he began to grill me and drill me about everything, about prophecy and things of this nature. And, oh, and he was just telling me all about how that, that can't be, that's not Bible, that's not going to, that, that, that won't be, I don't understand that, I think you're off on all that. And I mean, and I look back and think about that dude, and I think about how back in those days it was so difficult to see it. But now, and I remember he, one of the things he told me, he said, the United States doesn't use metric. We'll never be a part of the one world government. The whole world's metric, but we're not. I remember him telling me that, and you know, and he shook his head and walked out and said, the day we're not, you know, that we're metric, I'll believe you. And I, and I just thought, well, my God, he's right. But today, my friend, we are metric because our world is metric. The computer itself is not the mark of the beast because you have a computer. I remember back in early computer days, Preachers would preach against it because it's the mark of the beast. The computer is not the mark of the beast. Just like money is not evil, it's the love of it. Money's not evil. It's paper with a few dead presidents' pictures on it. But if you start loving it more than you love your family, if you sell drugs to make it, if you destroy people's lives, if you rob banks, and well, well, on and on and on. Next slide. Let's move on. I got to get through. Hey, what time is it right now? Is it? Is it already time to shut down? I was supposed to shop. What stop? Wasn't I? Oh my God! Let, let, let me get through. Jesus descends onto the Mount of Olives. Zechariah fourteen three and four. When Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives, the saints then will be immortal with him and come back with him. In Acts, uh, in Revelation 19, they come back, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands that come back with Jesus. Out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword, and by his word, and when he speaks his word, the armies of the world will be defeated and destroyed. I mean, look right now. Is the world gathered around Israel? Yes. Is there a hatred for the Jews? Yes. Why does the world hate them? Because Satan hates them. The reason Satan hates them is because they're God's physical people. And because that is the location where Jesus is coming back. If he can control Mount Olives, if he can keep Jesus off this earth, then he won't be bound for a thousand years and he won't be cast in the lake of fire. But we, you and I, are a part.
part of this prophetic utterance of God. This church, the operation of this church is a prophetic utterance of God. I told you I would close with this. Watch this. Here are the reasons why Jesus is going to come back before the opening of the first seal, Revelation 6. Matthew 24 says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of Jesus Christ. Noah was seven days shut up inside the ark. Not one drop of rain fell on the head of Noah. And Noah is a type of the rapture of the church. Lot was taken out of Sodom. God said, I cannot send wrath down upon here till you come out of there, Lot. Not any fire, not one flame of fire touched Lot. He came out, and then the fire came down. Joseph sitting in uh, the, 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 the uh, throne room of Egypt, given second in command. His brothers sold him into slavery. They didn't know that he was now second in command of Egypt. His brothers come in, and Joseph is about to reveal himself to his brothers. I'm Joseph. I'm your brother that you put in the pit, that you pulled out and you sold to a caravan. I'm your, I'm your brother. Joseph was a Jew. So was his brothers. So he looked at the Egyptians, Gentiles, and he says, get out of the court. And he dismissed them and they all left. And then he revealed himself. Then he revealed himself. God's going to take the Gentile church out and then he's going to reveal himself. Joseph, a type of Jesus, he's going to reveal himself to his brethren, his brothers, his children, the Jews. The children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. No judgment fell till they got on the other side and then the waters came in and destroyed the, in, the enemy of Israel. Jesus is telling this church, you're here and you're here for a short time and you're my people and I'm going to give you great power and I want you to tell everybody, I want you to preach it. Now we're not supposed to go crazy about it, but we're to preach it, we're to live it. Remind ourselves when we're going through things when you bury a saint of God deep down inside of us, there's a joy that you don't find in the world. When you bury a saint of God, I've buried many saints of God. When you bury them, there's something inside of you that's exciting. When we buried my mother, the last thing I told my mom over that grave and I touched her casket, I'll see you in the rapture, mom. I'll see you in the rapture, Mom. That's why I pray. Let's stand. That's why I pray every day for my children. I pray a hedge around them, the power of the hedge of Job, around my family every day. You're in this church right now. And you better stop. Everything comes out of the mouth of the man of God is important. These ministers are someone you're supposed to lift up. You ought to pray for your pastor, your bishop every day. If you listen to the things they say, they are the mouthpiece of God. God has given them words to speak to you. If you'll just learn to honor them and to follow them as they follow Christ. Get in this church. It's not a lot for God to ask of us. You pray, you read the word of God, you live a life that God wants you to live. I'm not missing anything in sin. Everything that I've given up in sin, I've gotten way better in the kingdom of God, in the presence of God. This morning, right now, and every day of your life, you need to live a, live, a, live a life of repentance. You need to pray prayers that God can answer. Let's pray together right now, and then we're going to turn. I, I went over. I figured I was going to this morning. This went by so fast. Jesus, I first of all, praise you and thank you. I lift you up because you're Jesus. You're the Lord. Lord, I pray for the men of God. I pray for pastor and bishop, their wife, their wives, their family, their children. I pray your continuous anointing, health, and blessing on every one of them. I pray that bishop, oh God, this morning, would you just write down over him a large number of years and he'll live healthy and anointed and blessed. God, because he stepped up to being a bishop, 
It's adding years to his ministry and his life. He's not through. He's not retired. But his position is allowing him to lengthen his ministry, to be able to speak of the things of God, to be able to lay his hand and believe and have faith and believe. God, give him great help. Move through his body. Touch every component of his body right now. Lord, heal him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Anoint, I pray, pastor right now. Let angels gather around him, Sister Nielsen, every day. And his family, Lord, in the name of Jesus, give him a clear vision, a clear understanding of the path of this church. I pray for this great church. I pray for this Holy Ghost church. I pray for this worshiping church. I pray for this God-fearing church. It will go in the rapture. And God, I pray for all the saints of God that Bishop and Pastor has planted in the ground. And on that great morning, that great hour when you come back, Jesus, and they come up out of that ground and we reunite with them. Let that ever be on our minds in Jesus' name. Lift your hands and give Jesus the praise. Amen.